Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome. My name is Greg Beadle. I am the curator of Cenozoic Invertebrates here at the Paleontological Research Institution, uh, PRI for short. Uh, the purpose of our webinar tonight will be, one, to thank all of you who have contributed to our campaign to fund research here uh, in our amino acid racemization lab at PRI, um, as well as give you an opportunity to interact with our team a little bit and ask them questions about our research and, and how what we're up to. Um, but before I do that, I should let Steve, one of our team members, introduce himself and go over some of the logistics for the webinar. Right. Hi, everybody. I'm Steve Durham. Uh, at the time of the campaign, I was a graduate student of Greg's at uh, Cornell. And now I'm a uh, fellow at the Florida Coastal Office in the Florida Department of Environmental Protection. So I'm coming to you from sunny Tallahassee tonight. Um, and I've been tasked with orienting you to the Zoom interface. Um, some of you I'm sure are familiar with it, but um, if you move your mouse, <clears throat> there's a toolbar that pops up. If you have any questions, type them into the chat box and Greg, Greg or I will get back to you. We can type back to you so that you know, it won't interrupt John's talk or anything. So just feel free to reach out. And thanks a lot for, for joining tonight. Great. Um, okay, so I get the distinct pleasure of, of introducing our speaker, uh, distinguished speaker tonight, uh, John Waymiller, who is Professor Emeritus in the Ge in Geological Sciences at the University of Delaware, uh, and also a research associate here at, the, at PRI. Um, uh, John is, a probably a world-renowned uh, expert in amino acid racemization geochronology. So it really is a treat to have him here uh, tonight uh, with us. Now, when the three of us got together and we're trying to think about what the topic should be for this uh, uh, webinar, we wanted it to be something that everyone could get something out of. Um, so we settled on trying to figure out um, you know, something common, something that's familiar to everybody. There's a little a shell, a seashell. This one is actually from a beach in New Jersey. Those who, those who are familiar. Um, but if you imagine if you're on a beach, um, you can ask a lot of different questions. If you're like me, you walk around and say, ask yourself, why are all these here? How did they get here? Where did they come from? But one question you might, it's, it's hard to answer, you might ask yourself, is just how old is this shell? And I don't mean how old in the sense of how old I am. I'm in my 40s. Um, I mean, in a geological sense, like when did this animal, which is now dead and it's just a shell, live? And then you can ask yourself other questions once you know that. Like, did all the other shells on this beach live at the same time? Hard questions to answer. But the technique, uh, and really in John's expertise in this amino acid racemization uh, capabilities that we have here at, at PRI, can answer that kind of question. And I think that's, um, I hope, what John is going to answer for us. <laughs> uh, I guess I'll turn it over to you now, John, if you want to switch out to your presentation and let you tell us what the answer is. All right, let's go. Uh, so, I'll, following Greg's introduction, I will tell you a little bit of a story about myself that I hadn't thought I would say, but uh, I started this work of using amino acids to estimate the ages of beach shells about 25 years ago, mostly as a challenge for some colleagues at the U.S. Geological Survey. We had been studying Pleistocene de age deposits of the Atlantic coastal plain for many years, and somebody said to me, how do you know that those shells that you're analyzing are in place and, and have not been transported some distance? And there are some, there are some answers that one can give based upon the physical preservation and the association of the shells with each other and things like that, and just on the statistics of, of observations, how many appear to be of the same age and things like that. But I started to uh, challenge myself a little bit, and I spent uh, a, sab a sabbatical in 1993 walking most of the beaches of North Carolina to see if I could explore this question a bit. And uh, some of what you'll see are some examples of that work and some of some more recent work that was really is ongoing right now. So very briefly, amino acids are found as 
proteinaceous and peptide material within the mineral phase of all carbonate all skeletal material. The figure at the lower right here shows sort of a, a an imaginary building block of carbonate, calcium carbonate with organic material both within and surrounding little blocks of calcite or aragonite. And those amino acids are in this form here. They exist in two forms as mirror images of each other, levo or left-handed forms and dextro or right-handed forms where there's a central carbon atom and four different side chains extending off to the four corners of a tetrahedron. And these two are physically different. Uh, they, are, they only can be uh, converted one to the other if one removes the hydrogen and then flips the entire molecule sort of inside out on itself. So this, these two forms are referred to as mirror images of each other. And the conversion from one to the other is referred to as racemization. And in living organisms, uh, we have predominantly almost 100% left-handed or levo forms. And in ancient uh, fossil material, we have an equal mixture of the right-handed and the left-handed forms because the reaction can go back and forth. So if one looks at a graph of dextro to levo or right to left, increasing from zero to one over time, this is somewhat theoretical, but it has some real world examples of the curve of racemization rises rather abruptly at the beginning and then slows down because it's a, a chemical reaction. It's temperature dependent. So something going at eight degrees centigrade would follow this curve and get to a ratio of about 0.5 in 600,000 years or so. Something at 18 degrees centigrade would get up near 0.9 in the same amount of time. So it's a, it's a qualitative tool for estimating ages because of this temperature dependence, but it can be calibrated under certain circumstances and, and applied to a variety of problems. And it has a great advantage in that it's economical and relatively fast to, to do sample preparations, much less expensive than radiocarbon, for example, and it's applicable over a much wider or longer time range. So some principles, all basics of amino acid racemization. The ratio increases with age for samples with equal temperature histories. The ratio increases with temperature for samples of equal age. Different amino acids are found in these, mo in these mollusks or other carbonate organisms. They racemize with different rates and all different mollusks are, have different rates of racemization. So there are fast racemizers and slow racemizers and we can use these differences uh, for uh, working with problems on different time scales. One of the things that's not, not unique to amino acid racemization, certainly any geochemical dating method uh, will be affected by things that can alter the, the, uh, the quality of the sample, uh, recrystallization, contamination, things like that. So, so every fossil that might be dated by any dating method is vulnerable to geochemical factors like this. So these are some of the things that research requires us to understand. Now, looking at the Atlantic Coastal Plain, which has been the field area that I've been most interested in over, over my career, well, this is a map of all the area from New Jersey to North Carolina. The red bands are all showing the approximate positions of where rivers flowed during times of lower sea level during glacial stages or when ice volume was was large and gla the glacial margin basically was across northern New Jersey and Long Island. So large ice volume, low sea level, rivers flowed all in configurations much different from what they are today. And then during non-glacial times like today, the shorelines migrated inland, sorry, all, and all we have the present shorelines here or even farther inland, especially in the Carolinas and Delmarva Peninsula. So one of the things we've been interested in 
all along is looking at the ages of deposits created by these sea level fluctuations back through the past million or two million years, which is the time range over which amino acid racemization works in the mid-Atlantic. And this is an example of an exposure in Virginia Beach, Virginia, a commercial sand and gravel excavation. And there's a shell bed there and another shell bed there. They are exposed in this little pinnacle of, of material that was left by the bulldozers. And we went in there, this is 25 years ago, we started analyzing material from these, these units. And where everybody had thought this was all sort of the same age material, we measured amino acid racemization all information from these two units and estimated that they were about 100,000 years difference in age based upon a DL value of a single amino acid around 0.2 and around 0.4 using the same genus of mollusk found in these two beds. And that's just about a two foot, three foot difference all, all separating those, those two units. So, we started to identify multiple age units where people had well, speculated or, or argued that there was only one age unit. And of course, we got a lot of controversy over things like that, but eventually we, we won out. So all, over longer periods of time, the history of sea level fluctuation in our area looks something like this. This is a synthesis of a whole lot of records that are not based upon coastal records, but on deep sea records that suggest that going back in time, this would represent the present sea stand, a low sea stand, where's my cursor? All of a sudden, there's my cursor, a low sea stand, a high sea stand, low, high, low, high, low, high, so on and so forth, going back about 800,000 years. So there have been these multiple cycles of sea level rises and falls that have generated and produced these, these coastal deposits that we're looking at. Some of the shells that we, we look at all for or, or use for amino acid racemization studies are seen here. Probably many of you work with these or know of these just from walking the beaches. All spicula is the common surf clam. Mercenaria is a robust shell type that we find in a lot of the deposits of the Atlantic Coastal Plain, Ensis, Mulinia, Astarte, there are a few others that we use, but these are Mulinia and Mercenaria are probably the two most common that we've used uh, looking at onshore deposits just because they are quite common throughout the, the coastal plain. So now we go to the beaches, and this is a photograph on the left taken whole in January of 1993 on one of my sabbatical trips. This is at the very tip of well, Cape Hatteras. This is our wonderful golden retriever helping to collect at the time. And within about a six meter square area, we found shells of both Pleistocene and Holocene age, well, three or four different well, age groups. And I'll show you some data from these in just a few minutes. And then the, the slide on the right, it was an example from farther south in North Carolina and Trish Kelly, I'm sure you've seen this all over the place. This happens to be a mercenaria shell that is about 4,000 4, years in age based, of, no, I'm sorry, the, the, uh, the corals that are attached to this shell are about 4,000 years in age based on radiocarbon and the shell itself is, I'm losing my cursor here, the shell itself is several hundred thousand years in age. So these are, these corals are colonial, all they are attaching themselves to whatever hard substrate one can find. And in this case, they, they were living a few thousand years ago and they attached themselves to a mollusk that was alive several hundred thousand years ago. This is the lab at PRI. This is the equipment that uh, we moved from the University of Delaware to PRI a few years ago. Greg is in that lab and he will show some images of that oh, if there's time. This is the, the instrument that's known as a gas chromatograph. Oh, and there's a computer underneath the desk here that runs all the, all the oh, all hardware in this. There's a big display screen up here that shows the output from the chromatogram or the chromatograph, 
and I'll show you what these the the output looks like. This is a photograph of the the instrument when it was still at Delaware. Here's that same instrument. Well, there's an auto sampler on it so we can load up multiple samples and run it essentially overnight. This is the display all from the instrument. And the essence of the machine is the chromatographic column, which in this case is it's shown here. It's a glass capillary tube that's 25 meters long and a fraction of a millimeter in inside diameter. And amino acids get prepared through some wet chemistry and then swept onto the column with a stream of helium gas, and then they get detected by a, a, a flame that basically burns them and ionizes them, and then that's the output that shows up on the screen here. So the real, real essence of gas chromatography is the, the science of making these columns and setting them up so that they are, they are tuned to the kind of separation that one is interested in. This is what a chromatogram actually looks like. The horizontal axis is basically the runtime of an analysis, and the vertical axis is the voltage generated by the detector. And so here we are looking at the dextro and levo forms of one amino acid, alanine, the dextro and levo forms of a second amino acid, valine, dextro and levo forms of a third amino acid, leucine, aspartic acid, and then this foursome here is the dextro and levo forms, right and left forms of phenylalanine and glutamic acid. So if you're really sharp, you might be able to eyeball that each of these pairs of peaks has a different ratio of the D to L forms. And I'm gonna show you in detail just a blow up of this portion of the chromatogram for two different samples of different ages. So this is, this is a screen capture off the uh, computer of all what this looks like. So this is D-leucine and L-leucine for a sample that is 7.2 kilo on O or 7,200 7, years in age, 7,200 years in age. And here's D and L-proline. It's not quite fully resolved, but still qualitatively you can see that the D peak is about 20 to 25 percent of the L peak. The D leucine peak is about 15 percent, perhaps 20 percent of the of the L leucine peak. And so that's something that's about 7,000 years old. Here is a sample that's about 600,000 years old. The D and L leucine peaks are Comp nearly the same size. The DL ratio of leucine would be about 0.8. For proline, I think you can see this would be also about 0.8. So that's that's a, a, re a qualitative clock, and this is the, the output that we get out of the instrument. So here are six shells collected at that at Cape Hatteras the, in that photograph that I showed with our golden retriever, and this is the DL leucine value in those six shells, 0 0.16, 0 0.37, 0 0.25, 0 0.46, 0 0.30, 0 0.31. Just given the statistics of, of these measurements and how these things are sampled and, and variability within the sample, we would probably conclude that the 25, 30, and 31 are all representing the same unit, whatever that unit is, whatever that source unit might be. The 0.46 is definitely something older. The 0.37 may be all part of this group. It may be part of this group, or it may be an intermediate between those, those, those two extremes. And the only one that is dated by some independent method is this one down here with a ratio of 0 0.16, and it is yielded a radiocarbon date of 7,345 years. We always approach this work where we get the amino acid ratios first, and then we submit the samples that we think are going to be most useful for radiocarbon, and then we get an independent calibration. Where are these things coming from? Oh, these are at least three, perhaps four different ages of shells, all collected within a few meters of each other, at the tip of Cape Hatteras. This is a very complicated slide, but it shows a geologic cross-section, basically 
on the back side or the west side of the barrier islands of, of North Carolina. Here's Cape Hatteras right here. And all of these different squiggly lines are representing multiple age or different age sea level deposits within what's known as the Albemarle Embayment, this region in here. And the islands, the Hatteras Islands, sits on top of all of these older units. And the color coding here represents different amino zones that we recognize, different clusters of amino acid ratios within the region. So we see these different ages that are showing up on the beaches throughout the subsurface of the entire North Carolina coastal plain. Now, getting a little bit closer to home, and this is, this is part of the quiz that you all looked at, or perhaps you looked at. This is on Paramore Island in Virginia. Checking on my time here. We collected this shell. This is a spicula shell, shell a common surf clam. We collected this in 1992, and I immediately knew that something was strange about it, and we did the amino acid analysis on it and said this thing has to be old. And so we sent it off for a radiocarbon date, and it came back with an age basically of near, beyond the detection limit or at, at the detection limit of the laboratory, about 45,000 years. So we, we knew that this was, was a, a puzzle when we collected it, and we went back and collected some more samples later on from the same site. And these, these samples are showing up here. These are six samples from Paramore Island, and I'm not going to tell you the answer to this just yet, but uh, some of these are Pleistocene, 100,000 years or more in age, and some of them are less than 5,000 years in age. This is a, an expansion of that work that we've been doing with the U.S. Geological Survey. The group from with the Woods Hole branch of the U.S. Geological Survey has been collecting on these islands because these are all part of the Nature Conservancy and they are protected uh, as plover nesting sites. And uh, these colleagues have been collecting on several of these very inaccessible islands. And we've gotten some more of these spicula shells all from Wreck Island, which is down here. And they've come back with, with amino acid ratios that basically say they, are, they have to be older than any uh, of the uh, recent sea level rise of the past five or 6,000 years. So there are some ratios here that I'll try to explain. Aspartic acid is abbreviated ASX and glutamic acid is abbreviated GLX. So this one with a greater than 44,000 year age has an aspartic ratio of 0.47 and a glutamic ratio of 0.18. Then down here at, at Wreck Island, we have two shells 0.52 and 0.20, so basically a little bit higher than these, but comparable statistically. And then we have another one at 0.48 and 0.17. So all three of these shells, basically we would lump together and say that they have an aspartic ratio of about 0.5 and a glutamic ratio of say 0.19. And they've returned three different radiocarbon dates. And the only one we think we can trust is the one greater than 44,000 years because radiocarbon dating of shells in this age range often is vulnerable to contamination. We can discuss that more later if there's, there's time. So basically, three shells at two different sites all coming back with ages that would be surprising if we thought that they all had lived just during the time of most recent sea level rise, which is the past five, 6,000 years or so. This is a, a link, I'm gonna try to make this work. Uh, this is a link to a, a time lapse that shows where these wreck island sites were, were collected. I may have to minimize this for a minute, and it shows just how dynamic this coastal region is. I think maybe in the interest of time, I'll, I'll not do this right now and try to do this later if, if we have time. The most recent, okay, now see, so here are some more of these wreck islands, all spicula shells, and all of them have amino acid ratios that would tell us that they are 30 to 40 to 50,000 years or more in age based upon the radiocarbon calibrations. So here are eight of these shells. They all look very fresh. If you were walking on the beach, you probably would think 
that these had been alive sometime in the past few thousand years, but in fact, they are all at least 30,000 years old, and my guess is that they're probably 60 or 70,000 years old. And this is current work that we're doing right now, and literally we just submitted these samples for radiocarbon a few weeks ago. Well, these are all shells collected from Smith Island, which is farther south on Delmarva, on the Delmarva Peninsula. We analyzed 16 Mercenaria samples, here are some of them, and we analyzed 16 Spicula samples, here, here are some of those. All 16 of the Spicula samples have amino acid ratios that make us think that they are greater than 30,000 years in age and all 16 of the mercenaria samples collected have amino acid ratios that make us think that they are less than 6,000 years in age. And these were all collected at the same, basically in the same area, within 50 meters of each other. So for paleoecologists who might be hearing some, some of this, to hear that there are two assemblages of different taxa of vastly different ages, all found together, uh, could be pretty unnerving. So perhaps we'll have some discussion of that as we go forward. Oh, that's the last slide that I'm going to show, except for some information about all oh, other things that, that, if you're interested in getting more information about this, these are some references that we can provide. Oh, Greg and Steve and I have all of these. Oh, We've given you or distributed a link to a, a short publication that I did with Linda York, one of my students and postdocs, we did for the National Park Service about 15 years ago now. Well, the Park Service supported some of our work on southeastern North Carolina. Well, the first paper that we ever did on this was in 1995 in marine geology. And then Rob Thieler, our colleague at the USGS, and Linda York and I again did a big poster that summarized a lot of the work, well, at the time anyway, at the, GS, at the Geological Society of America meeting in 2015. And that poster is available for download all through the Geological Society of America website. But if you have questions about any of these, you can certainly contact me to, to uh, learn more about these references. I've also given provided some references to some some uh, recent sort of reviews of the analytical method and the, the principles of racemization dating. And so uh, this, this slide again is in thank you to those who have organized and or contributed to this. These three shells were all collected within a few meters of each other uh, on Topsail Island in southeastern North Carolina, or in Corebanks, I'm sorry, in, in southeastern North Carolina. This is a tertiary uh, sand dollar. This is that Pleistocene age shell with Holocene age corals attached to it. And then this is a Pleistocene age shell that's been serving as a substrate for, for all the critters that uh, take root on these things, attach themselves, and then dissolve away some of this shell material. Often we can look at the color of shells like this and know that, that Colors or shells, mercenaria shells that have this deep gray color to them must all be Pleistocene. And I think it's because of the, all, the all substrate or the, the all unit that they are buried in and something about the shell color just sort of it gets altered during, during burial. Oh, so I think we've got some time. Yes, I can show you this slide. Oh, this was one that Greg posted, Greg and Steve posted quite some time ago with the uh, five of the six shells from Paramore Island, Virginia. And the question was, oh, what are the geologic ages of these five shells? And the answer is going to show up on the next screen just with a little, little text up in the upper left. Oh, the, these two Come on, there's the cursor. This one and this one are Holocene in age, meaning less than about 5,000 years in age. This one is Pleistocene in age, probably 70 to 80 to 90,000 years. This is a spicula that is 70 to 80,000 years based upon our guess. And this is a Holocene mercenaria. So this is the answer to the quiz that Steve circulated quite some time ago.
So with that, I think I will stop and hopefully we have time for a lot of questions and discussion. Sure, thank you. Thank you, John. Um, we do have some questions. Uh, I guess we can just run in these in order. Steve and I can alternate. Uh, so John, we have a question. I'll read it to you. Um, are there any patterns, e.g. taxonomic, life mode, etc., regarding which tax are slow versus, versus fast racemizers? Oh, uh, very good question. Oh, um, there are, and, and I'll, uh, forgive me if I don't use the proper taxonomic terms, but I'll, uh, most of the venerids, oh, Coyone, Mercenaria, oh, what else? Oh, seem to, within the family level, oh, they all seem to racemize at the same rate. Oh, the, the, oh, the way that we approach this is that we recognize that oh, different different mollusks that are either fast or slow racemizers have different amino acid compositions. And those are, all, there, there are a few amino acids that seem to be really important is, as components of the mineral phase. And the slow racemizers seem to have an abundance of amino acids that all, would indicate that the, the protein or the peptide that's in those shells is relatively stable. And the fast racemizers appear to be ones that uh, have less stability to their amino or to their proteins. So what this means is that the unstable, the unstable proteins would decompose or break apart faster, and that breaking apart is is part of what drives the overall racemization. So if you've got a stable protein it's likely to be a slow racemizer. If you've got an unstable protein, it's likely to be a fast racemizer. This has been, this is a fundamental biogeochemical question that really needs to be investigated a whole lot more. But this is, this is my gut instinct as to what's driving the different racemization rates of different mollusks. And of course, the amino acid composition or the protein composition is something that's inherently part of the taxonomy of the shell. All right, I'll take the next one. So, um, can you explain the difference between uh, radiocarbon uh, and AAR dating? I think radiocarbon is a phrase that's probably more familiar to everybody than okay. the sort of dating that we are discussing. Right. Well, radiocarbon or carbon-14 depends upon the radioactive decay of the isotope carbon-14, which has a half-life of about 5,700 years, a little bit more than that. And what that means is that C14 or carbon-14 gets incorporated into any carbon-bearing oh, animal or plant. Oh, and in the case of mollusks, it gets incorporated into the calcium carbonate. And when that organism dies, the the C14 begins, it's the, when the organism is alive, that C14 is being constantly be replenished from the atmosphere, well, because that's where it's generated. But once the organism dies, gets isolated from the atmosphere, buried in sediments, well, then the C14 starts to decay. And after one half-life, after 5,700 years, one half of that carbon, original carbon-14 is gone. After two half-lives, we're down to a quarter of the original carbon-14. After three half-lives, or, or 15,000 years roughly, we're, we're down to one-eighth, so on and so forth. So the radiocarbon clock basically dies out at about 35 or 40 to 45,000 years, depending upon the, how, it's, how, it, how the measurements are made. So samples older than about 40,000 years are extremely difficult to date with, with carbon-14. And by 60,000 years, there's literally no C14 left. And so samples that old are undateable. 
particles. But that is an isotopic method or a radioactive method, so it's not sensitive to temperature of the way amino acid racemization, which is a chemical reaction, well, temperature doesn't affect the rate at which radioactive decay occurs. But there are factors such as bacteria and groundwater and things like that that can introduce uh, contaminants, radiocarbon, from, from groundwater, from the atmosphere, from vegetation, things like that. So a sample that, that otherwise might be pristine may have exchanged a little bit of carbon, modern carbon, with the atmosphere, and it might have this, this contaminant carbon in it that makes it look younger than it really is. And that's why we get this, this range of C14 ages for samples that really appear to have the same amino acid age to them. Hope that helps. Okay, John, we have another question here. I think this may have been answered already um, in your presentation, but I'll ask it anyway. Uh, can you use shell condition to tell how old uh, a shell is? Oh boy. <laughs> oh, not really. That's that's the strange thing because because so uh, we can find. Uh, well, I'll, I'll I'll answer it another way. Oh, these these shells that we find on beaches are really uh, a very biased kind of record because the only ones that are going to sur survive for a, a, any significant amount of time on a beach are the are the durable ones. There are lots of fragile shells out there in the surf zone and shallow water behind the barrier islands or in, in deeper water. And if they get up on the beach and get pounded by the waves for even a few days, they're probably going to fall apart. But Mercenaria happens to be an extremely robust shell, and so it can survive for a long time in the surf zone. The, the spicula that I showed you from Paramore Island were the ones that were really a surprise to us because I've always thought of that shell as being relatively fragile, and yet uh, we find these things extensively preserved on the beaches. And what that means to me is that that they haven't they haven't traveled very far from their source unit, wherever this host unit is that's being exposed in the surf zone, uh, they just haven't traveled very far to get to where they're found on the beaches. And the animation that I, I will try to show you if there's time uh, shows something about this, this particular collection site and how, how recently active it is. So we'll see if there are any more, if there are no more questions after a while, I can show you this, this uh, time, time lapse image. Okay. Um, another question. Along the Atlantic coast, uh, which beaches did you find had the oldest shells? Oh, well, it, that's, a, that's a neat question. And actually in the poster that we put up at, on the GSA website, we have some graphs that show, oh, I mean, the, the study area that we've worked on the most is the Outer Banks of North Carolina because these are nominally pristine beaches, although there has been some, some uh, beach nourishment in a few cases, in a few places. But uh, the, the poster has some graphs that show the relative frequency of young, meaning Holocene shells, versus Pleistocene or old, older or Pleistocene shells as we go down the Outer Banks from Oregon Inlet, which is up sort of at the north end of Hatteras Island, all the way down to Cape Hatteras and around the corner, all the way down to, to uh, Cape Fear. And the relative proportion of older shells increases pretty much steadily as we go from north to south. And we can relate this at least in part to the offshore geology where there's less and less uh, sediment cover on the older tertiary rocks of, that are exposed uh, off of, of Cape Fear and in Onslow Bay to the southern, in the southern part of that, that North Carolina study area. So we find a whole lot of middle Pleistocene shell material, three, 400,000 year old material along the uh, southern outer banks 
uh, and on down to Cape Fear, but we find virtually none of that all in the northern Hatteras Island area. And so the source of that older material is just much more accessible, I think, to wave energy in the southern part of the region. And then that's what surprised us a bit about finding these older shells in, in central Delmarva and southern, southern Delmarva Peninsula because there's a lot of sediment on the continental shelf out there, but there clearly seems to be a host unit uh, that, that is providing these shells all to the beaches uh, fairly nearby. Okay, uh, John, we have a question related to a previous one. Um, what does color of the shells mean? What does it mean? Okay. Oh, here again, it's, it's, I think the answer to that question is, is specific to uh, a shell genus and also to the geographic region of study. But with the North Carolina work that we've done, and in our 1995 paper talks a lot about this because we, we, uh, we every shell that we analyzed, we put on a, on a, a color scale so that we tried to qualify or quantify the, the colors of these things. Uh, the color is, is something that the shell inherits, inherits after it's been buried. And I think there's something about the sedimentology of the units in which these mercenaria shells have been preserved that, uh, that gives them this, this gray, gray to even black color. And again, I'm sp talking specifically about one genus because there are other black shells down there that are, that are all completely different ages. But the mercenaria seem to get really dark gray and black if they have been buried for several hundred thousand years. And then this, the, when they come up on the beaches, you can walk the beaches and, and say if it's gray or black, dark gray or black, well, as opposed to orange or tan, well, it's almost definitely an old shell, meaning a little Pleistocene several hundred thousand years in age. All right, another question. Uh, why was the U.S. Geological Survey interested in the ages of the beach shells? Ah, uh, <laughs> well, the the uh, the person who did the collecting is a longtime colleague, Rob Thieler, who I first met when he was a graduate student at at Duke with Oren Pilkey, and Rob is all uh, did his PhD on on. Uh, coastal sediment transport in south, southeastern North Carolina. And after finishing at Duke, he took a position at USGS uh, up in, in Woods Hole. And his, the reason he was collecting on Southern Delmarva was not really to, to, uh, uh, for this project, but he was there looking at the, uh, the, the um, shore face stability and the, and the stability of the uh, southern Delmarva Islands well, because they are all clover nesting islands. And again, this is an extremely active, <coughs> geologically active area uh, where there's a lot of coastal migration and coastal erosion. The USGS, his program is, is involved in coastal hazards and coastal erosion and things like that. But as it turns out, well, the ages of the shells on the beaches say something about uh, sources of sediment getting to the beaches, and in this case, uh, something about perhaps about how fast some of these these beach, beach areas are eroding back. And again, the the, the uh, wreck island site, if one goes on some of these time lapse uh, Landsat or Google Earth images. Uh, one can see that parts of Wreck Island have migrated over a mile in about the past 10 years or so. And so it's an extremely active area. And where these shells are coming from, where these old shells are coming from, says something about the sources of sediment that do get to the beaches. So I think in an indirect way, the ages of the shells are, are a, a tool for, for looking at coastal sediment transport. Um, oh, sorry, we have um, two more questions. So I think we have time for those. 
Good. Okay, perfect. Um, could this method be used at a confirmed Pliocene Pleistocene site to see if indeed there are different age shells concurrent there, as is the case on the beaches? Oh, under certain circumstances, probably yes. The, the problem that we run into when we get back to that, to samples that old, is if you remember the shape of the curve of racemization versus time, it's flattening out as it gets back beyond about a million years. And so oh, the analytical uncertainty of a, of an, of a individual analysis can be as little as a couple of a percent. That meaning, meaning repeat analyses of the same sample. But if you had you know, 10 samples from the Pleistocene unit, or you might see as much as a plus or minus 10% uncertainty or range of, an, of results, range of DL values. And that would translate, translate, translate sorry, into an age uncertainty of perhaps 100,000 years. And so within the analytical uncertainty of multiple shell analyses at that time range, we probably couldn't resolve age differences unless they were larger than several hundred thousand years. So, so the answer probably is no if one's looking to, to uh, distinguish ages that, of, that might be just a few thousand years in age difference. Well, that uh, gets at the next question, which is how old a specimen can this method be used on? Okay. Well, again, because, because the method is temperature dependent, it works of, over different time ranges in different geographic regions. My colleagues at the University of Colorado who work in high latitude regions have used this method to estimate ages back to three or four million years in some cases. And these are with samples that are sitting at, at minus 20 degrees centigrade. If we go to the tropics, the, the method, the, the clock runs faster in the tropics, which is great if one's trying to resolve those small age differences within, say, the past 10 or 20,000 years. But the, the method really runs out of utility probably at about 50,000 years. Uh, in tropic, at tropical latitudes or tropical temperatures. There have been applications of the methods using other kinds of biominerals. One of the really fascinating ones that is, I think is very impressive is the, the group at Colorado has, has looked at ostrich eggshells and emu eggshells all from at, all Australia and South Africa and found that all these particular biominerals seem quite durable but again, they reach uh, complete racemization within about 100 to 150,000 years because they exist at, at tropical temperatures. Okay. Okay, let's, we've got these our last question. Um, you've got, well, we're under an hour now. I think it's I think it's a good time to end unless anyone wants to say in the chat that they really want to see what John was going to show us. I don't know what that was. Um, well, let me let me see if I can get this. It's a it's a time lapse Google Earth map, and I, I just got to see if I can master the technology here to 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 do this. I may have to stop the sharing and then start it again. All right. This is, let me get this going. This is the southern tip of Delmarva Peninsula. If you drive down the peninsula and cross the Bay Bridge, you drive right, right across here. Now this is the area, this is Wreck Island right here, where the cursor is. And watch how this, beach migrates over the past 20 years or so. And it's right on that little spit of land 
where all these Pleistocene shells were collected, right where the hand is right now. So they washed up sometime in the past 10 years and they must be coming from some unit that's right in the offshore area here. Farther to the south, Smith Islands is right here. Watch how much this migrates back over the past 25 years. It's lost almost a mile of, of islands with in 25 years. And this is where we're finding Pleistocene shells. Thanks, John. That's good to see that. Uh, I guess I can turn it over to, well, John, if you have any final things you may want to say before we sign off and- I think, I think well. I've, I've probably done enough. I'll stop the screen sharing here. So he, John has said he's done enough, Steve. Do you have any final things you want to say? Oh, just wanted to say thanks for joining us tonight and um, thanks so much for supporting our campaign it made a, a big difference in my graduate research and uh, you know, was a really uh, neat technique to learn as part of my PhD studies. And I should say something from PRI's perspective, you know, as an, inst an institutional perspective. Um, of course, we thank you. We're a small institution, so we depend a lot on the generosity of, of individuals, as well as, of course, governmental grants. But uh, so we thank you as well for all the support of, of our AAR lab. Stay tuned for more. And so. please, please contact us if you've got any questions. Great. Okay, I'm going to sign us all off, guys. Okay, Very thank you. Thank everyone participating. Send us questions if you have them. Great. Have thank a good night, everybody. Good night. Bye -bye.